Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, geeks and geekettes the world over, welcome to another edition of Ask Chuck Dixon, where you get to ask me questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books, and I've been doing it for decades. So I got a little bit of background, and um, I can answer uh, just about anything you throw at me, and you've thrown a lot. <laughs> Some very, very interesting questions. I pride myself on having a extraordinarily intelligent and curious audience for these things deeply deeply nerdy people and i say that with all due respect because i am genetically and uh, congenitally a nerd hey if you want to contact me if you want to ask questions make suggestions send dogs pictures cat pictures whatever suggest maybe a comic i haven't read or a book i haven't read uh, you can contact me at brunobookstore at gmail.com. Brunobookstore at gmail.com is the most reliable way of reaching me uh, on the, the World Wide Web. So, so use that because I check them every day. I mean, you can ask questions under the video or ask me questions on Facebook, but chances are I might miss one of them. So uh, direct results are the best results. Cody Gatlin asks, we hear a lot about method actors or people like Heath Ledger with the Joker who let their roles take over their personalities. Is this ever a problem with writers? Of course, plenty of writers self-insert themselves into their stories, but have you ever found that your personality changes due to the characters you're writing? Um, yeah, I never, I never put myself in my story, at least not consciously. I don't find myself that interesting. <laughs> I'm not fascinated by a Chuck Dixon. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of times I write to forget who I am. <laughs> uh, much as uh, people read to forget about the world around them, I, I write to create a, a world I prefer. Um, yeah, I can't really testify that, you know, uh, my mood changes as I write, but my wife will tell you that it does. So uh, she, she, she thought that I was, she could tell when I was writing Conan. <laughs> so I, was, I was different. Uh, my, my T levels went up <laughs> when I was writing Conan. So she could attest to that. Uh, but, and, and, and she was fine with that. She can also tell when I'm writing Westerns because I'm, I'm happy. I'm really, really happy. Um, I'm always happy writing, but Westerns for some reason. I just, you know, I'm like a kid in a sandbox. Uh, so th the things that my wife says have a negative effect on me is when I write things about parallel universes or time travel. Uh, she swears that I act, um, I'm risking schizophrenia if I continue writing in these genres. Uh, so I, I don't tell her when I'm writing time travel or parallel universe stuff. Uh, but somehow um, she knows. She says, you're writing time travel, aren't you? <laughs> this, this happens like when we're eating dinner and we're, we're just having a normal conversation or I'm, or I'm talking to the kids. And she goes, uh, yeah, yeah, I can tell. You're writing time travel, aren't you? And I have to confess, yes, I'm writing time travel. I thought you told me you'd never write that again. It's like, I have to. I love time travel stories. <laughs> what can I do? Uh, so, yeah, I guess my mood changes. If you can believe my wife, and you can always believe my wife. She's brutally frank. One of the things I love about her, one of the many things. David T. Zwally, have you ever collaborated with Larry Hama as an artist? If you haven't, what kind of project story would you see him illustrate for you? Uh, no, I've never collaborated, you know, directly collaborated with Larry. Larry was my editor on Savage Sword for a long time, and you know, we had lots of discussions and he would make story suggestions and things like that. But, um, you know, and, and, you know, guide me and, and instruct me on the various, um, you know, nuances and, you know, basically what he wanted in Conan, which, you know, 99.9% .9 was exactly what I wanted in Conan. So there was never any disagreements, but I never collaborated with him artistically. Um, just to tell you a Larry story, uh, I'm, I'm writing Savage Sword, and Larry called me 
early on, I'd written like three or four of them. And Larry said, I'm, I'm telling this to all of the Conan writers and artists. He says, I really want you to, you know, dig in on the brutality of the, the, <laughs> the Hyborian age. I really want you to, you know, I, I want to see eye gouging and beheading and, you know, decapitation. Well, that is beheading. Um, uh, dismemberment, you know, and, and just really get into the how, how mean and brutal and horrible. And he, and he wanted to, like, graphic descriptions of the kind of violence he wanted to see portrayed. And I said, okay, well, I, you know, I can do all that. I mean, I'm, I'm on board with making Conan as, you know, uh, you know, rough and tumble as I can, you know, uh, as visceral as I can. And he said, okay, okay, well, great, great, great. Oh, 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 and the other thing is uh, uh, stop having the characters say hell and damn. <laughs> so violence, okay. Uh, mild profanity, no, we, we, we can't have that. Um, as far as working with Larry, man, that, it would have been a kick to work with Larry artistically on anything because, you know, he's, he's the whole deal, you know. Larry is a renaissance man of comics. He's a renaissance man in general, you know, being, also being a musician and actor as well uh, and, and quite accomplished at everything that Larry does. Uh, if Larry decided he wanted to be an astronaut, I, I wouldn't doubt it for a second. I'd, I'd wait to see, you know, pictures of him spacewalking. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, you know, I would have dug working with Larry on something like that. I mean, I, I think our Venn diagram is pretty much just a circle when, when it comes to, uh, you know, what we like to see in a comic. So, yeah, it, it, that would have been cool. Chris, Ger oh, man, I, I read your name a million times. We've communicated back and forth a whole bunch of times. And, I, you know, here I am having to say your last name for the first time. Is it Jericic? Yeah, help me out. Uh, or, is, or is the J pronounced as a Y? I don't know. I don't know. I don't mean to offend. Uh, what do you think about DC losing their permanent business and editorial offices? I, I've spoken about this on a couple of videos previously, but it, it can't be ignored that losing your offices is a big deal. And I've heard excuses like covid <laughs> We're going to hear COVID as an excuse for the rest of our lives. Our children are going to hear COVID as an excuse for the rest of our lives. I've heard COVID blamed, uh, although they lost their offices after, you know, the pandemic had waned. Um, and then I hear that, well, everybody's working from home. Yeah, everybody was working from home two years ago. They're not working from home now. Um, you know, we saw lots of articles about how wonderful it was to work from home uh, because, you know, it, it's state-run media and they're going to report whatever the government tells them to report. Like now we're hearing that inflation is a good thing. <laughs> Remember in the 90s, all the newspaper articles about lying was actually healthy for you? <laughs> so anyway, um, all of the tech businesses and entertainment businesses are asking their people to come home, come back to the office. We want to see you in the office working. Uh, you know, the, all this bugaboo about working from home being more efficient and more economical and all, that's all history. That's not true anymore. I was, you know, that was true then. It's, it's not true now for some reason. So come back in, sit at your desk, get back to your cubicle. Um, but D.C., they did the opposite. They said, go away, go away, go home. Go, we don't want to see you around here anymore. And then they began firing people. Uh, so there's, you know, every week it seems like we hear another round of firings. you got to wonder, you know, what is it, like three or four people running D.C. Comics now? Uh, I mean, how much dead wood can you trim uh, until, you know, there's, no, there's not enough wood left to keep the boat afloat? Uh, to, to torture an, an analogy. Um, and as I've said in previous videos, uh, having an office in Hollywood, in Burbank, uh, in, in a Warner's building, is a big deal. Uh, it's important where your office is, what floor it's on, how many windows it has, if you have windows in your office. It's important in that town where you park your car, where you eat lunch. Everything's important. For them to send you home basically makes you a non-entity. And the reason why they probably sent DC home is, first of all, you know, they're not earning any money. They're a, they're a loss leader for the company, but they got to keep them around because of the licensing properties. Uh, 
And, and the other reason is they probably needed the office space for people that were actually, you know, earning for Warners or, you know, need just, you know, <laughs> maybe, they're, maybe they're just needed the offices for storage. <laughs> so I don't know, but it's a sad state of affairs. Um, and even sadder because DC Comics did it to themselves. They basically made themselves irrelevant. Um, you know, and, and he did this over the course of a couple of decades by not standing up for the brand. Back in the days when Jeanette Kahn ran the company or Paul Levitz ran the company, Jeanette and Paul stood up for the brand and they stood up for their freelancers and their employees and they were proud of the product they were producing. Um, the people that run DC now, you know, <laughs> however many there are, um, seem indifferent to all of that. And, and they just kowtow to Warners. And you can say, well, you know, you know, whatever you want about Jeanette and Paul, but they stood up to Warners. They did, again and again and again. Stood up and, and did the right thing um, to keep the brand going. Because that was their job, was to promote the brand. But of course, in the early 2000s, we saw a period where the company was run by a guy who ran the brand down all the time. I've never seen anybody run a company and complain about its product as much as Dan DiDio did. And the end result is, go home. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. Okay, Levi Sweeney. Have you ever written or have wanted to write a story where the protagonist is a criminal, a gangster, or some other variety of bad guy? Actually, uh, yeah, I've done that. I did a uh, truncated series at... Uh, now Comics in the 90s called Alias. It was truncated because uh, Now Comics stopped paying us. But we kept working <laughs> anyway, hoping that eventually they would pay us. We just didn't hand in our, our pages. I, I didn't hand in scripts and the artists didn't hand in pages. Luckily, the art was being done by you know two buddies of mine, uh, Todd Fox and Enrique Villagran. So we uh, there was solidarity there amongst the freelancers. And uh, But Alias is about a... Uh, what appears to be a hitman and an FBI agent gets the idea that maybe this guy isn't just a hitman. Maybe he's actually a serial killer. Uh, and he organizes his, uh, you know, mental pathology by uh, getting paid for it, basically being assigned his kills rather than seeking them out on his own. And uh, that's the uh, high concept for the series, which you can now read for the first time in its entirety. Uh, Antarctic Press is re publishing Alias, uh, you know, and you'll be able to read the complete story for the first time ever. A lot of people, I mean, it's been 30 years of people asking me, how does this story end? Well, now you can read it for yourself from Antarctic Press. Um, the, old, the other time I wrote about criminals is in my novel Shrinkage. It's about a shoplifter. It's set in 1970s and in Philadelphia, and uh, it's uh, the, the guys, that, as the slug line says, it's a novel of petty theft. It's about a guy who uh, makes his living as a sneak thief, and this causes him no end of problems in his personal relationships and actually um, inserts him to quite a dangerous situation as things go along. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think I've written other stuff from the point of view of a criminal. I mean, the Punisher is certainly a criminal. Um, he's an outlaw. Anyway, even though he's the good guy in the story, he's certainly a lawbreaker. So writing the Punisher is much like writing a villain or a bad guy, uh, even though he's the good guy by default in most of his stories. Andrew Runyon. If you had to give Levon Cade character a spinoff novel, who would it be? Well, you know, Levon's another outlaw. He's a lawbreaker as well. Um, if I had to, if I had to <laughs> spin off from Levon, it, it would be his daughter Mary. Uh, I, I, you know, I've thought about writing short stories uh, or, or a novel about Mary. Maybe I'll get around to it. But um, you know, Meredith Cade, his daughter, uh, who t who's now a uh, 16 in the most recent novel um, is uh, is a really cool character. I've, I've, I've you know I've really grown to like uh, Mary and, and her, her adopted little sister Hope. 
so, and I think that's what gives, Mary is what made Levon different from most of the vigilante craze, or most of the vigilante genre, is um, most of these guys are loners. They're lone wolves. But I wanted to have, because, um, <laughs> you know, speaking of lone wolves, I, I wanted to have um, Levon have someone that he cared about, someone he had to look after. Uh, you know, it, it creates stakes um, for the character, uh, but it also uh, humanizes them more. So they're, they're not at a dead end in their life. Their, their life will go on. I mean, for, for Punisher and a lot of these other characters, they, they turn to vigilanteism, and it's literally a death wish. They're literally on a suicide mission. Um, the end for them will be violent and bloody and horrible. Uh, Levon can't do that because he has people at home to look out for. And speaking of Levon and his most recent novel, uh, you can now pre-order Levon's Prey. Uh, it'll be out uh, in just a few weeks on Kindle and in paperback. And it's kind of um, the uh, third book in a, a sort of trilogy within the series in which Levon is dealing with a child trafficking ring in uh, his beloved Alabama. Uh, and he deals with them. Trust me, Levon deals with the child trafficking ring. Nick Camboras. I'm just going to leap right in on that one. Who should be cast as MCU's Galactus? To which the only appropriate answer should always be Liam Neeson, LOL. <laughs> I'll give you Liam Neeson, and I'll raise you Nick Cage and CGI Charles Bronson. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who would play Galactus. Someone with a very, very deep voice. Uh, and, you know, he would, he would mostly be CGI anyway, except his face. I, I don't think they're going to put an actor in that costume. <laughs> uh, and he has to be CGI anyway because he's bigger than everybody else. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of people that could do it. You know, let's see who they choose. Just He's got to have a deep, booming, scary voice. And, um, you know, we'll wait and see. I just hope they do it. I just hope they start making Fantastic Four movies that are in the classic Kirby fashion instead of whatever the hell it was they've, they've done previously. It's sort of watered down, diluted uh, pastiches, uh, lame pastiches of, of the original Lee and Kirby stories. Ray Felix, if you could develop Bane today, what direction would you take him in? Um, the same direction Graham and I have always been taking him in. Um, I wouldn't alter anything. I would, uh, we, our, our, in our minds, the continuing saga of Bane ends with him sitting atop the DC underworld. He is the, he's the Dr. Doom of the DC universe. We see him as the emperor of crime. Um, He's calling the shots globally, worldwide, because he's an ambitious dude, and he always has been, and that's what we saw him. And, and every story that Graham and I have done together have taken him down that path. I mean, from the very beginning, um, we wanted Bane to, you know, be, you know, be a major part, not just of Batman continuity, but of the DCU. And, uh, you know, he's been adopted by fans. Everybody loves him. I, I, I was listening to the radio today, and somebody made a Bane reference on the radio. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I would go. I wouldn't alter anything we've done and I would not change direction at all. Hey, sip of tea. That was for me, not you. If you don't have tea, don't feel bad. Okay. Daniel Jackowitz. Hey, Chuck, love the long ACD question on the cover of Savage Sword of Conan. It looks like Solomon Kane. Have you ever written any Solomon Kane? Is that a character you would be interested in? And if so, what stories would you tell? He's talking about this issue of Savage Sword of Conan with this uh, terrific cover uh, with Conan and Solomon Kane together, something that does not happen inside the issue. I think the, the, the magazine obviously had a Solomon Kane backup. No, I never wrote any Solomon Kane. I, I love the character. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. Howard didn't write a whole lot of stories about Kane, so there's a bunch of open territory and I would probably be most tempted because of the period to do a, a nautical story a pirate story of some kind with Kane 
Uh, that's that's you know my knee jerk reaction to this question is, yeah, uh, you know Puritan sword, flintlocks. Yeah, let's get him on board a pirate ship, uh, in one way or another, and have some sort of an adventure on a, you know, mysterious island or something strange happening at sea. Joel Mangrum just he's just gonna carpet bomb me with questions, and I'm gonna take them all at once. Number one is tired of talking about Bane. Two, any subject you're tired of talking about. Three, do you own any art from the books you've done? And if so, what's your favorite piece? Four, the one thing you've written everyone should read. Five, giant robots or robot giants? Um, nah, I, I'm not tired of talking about Bane. And, and a lot of people will say that, like, you know, you're getting the same questions all the how'd you create Bane? You know, uh, but I like telling that story. I mean, I've told it a bunch of times. And the other thing, particularly when you're at a convention and people are asking me that question, well, it's, you know, if you've ever, and I've done this, I've been on the other side of the table, I approach somebody that I want to ask questions to, I talk to a comic book creator that I like, and um, you want to start a conversation, but it's like, what to ask? You know, you don't want to ask the most obvious thing. Um, my oldest son is a master at meeting celebrities and asking them questions they would be truly interested in answering. <laughs> he, he's, he's incredible at starting up conversations with celebrities that it's not just like, oh, this question again. He always comes up with something fascinating um, to get them engaged and actually talk to them, not just, you know, Q&A. Uh, I don't have that talent, and most people don't, you know. Um, you know, you don't know how, so, so a lot of people just ask the obvious question, how did you create your most famous creation? And, and I realize, yeah, I've told the story a bazillion times, but this is the first time this person's asking it. And so I have to show them the courtesy of realizing that, you know, they want some sort of personal response from me. And so I tell the story again. I tell it in different ways. I, everything is the truth, but I'll tell it in different ways or whatever to amuse myself. But um, I don't mind telling the story. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm proud of what Graham and I did on Bain, and I don't mind uh, sharing that with people. So if you ever see me at a con or whatever, and, you know, just come up and say hi and, you know, ask whatever question you want. I, don't think, hey, he's probably tired of answering this because I'm not. And, and you know, and, and that goes in general, you uh, for any topic. I mean, um, I like talking to fans. I like having a conversation. Um, and, you know, but I realize how difficult it is, you know, to talk to a stranger, basically. You know, you, and, 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 you know, uh, people that come up to me at cons, they, they know about things about me because <laughs> they can have read them on the internet or they've read my work or whatever. I don't know anything about them. So it's kind of a one-sided deal, but you know, I'm perfectly cool with answering any question about anything. Now on the subject of original art, yeah, I have a lot of art from stuff I've worked on over the years. Uh, you know, usually generously gifted to me by the artists. Uh, on a few occasions, I've taken advantage of that and I've actually written pages that I wanted to own uh, I wrote a splash page of Blue Beetle into an issue of Birds of Prey, and I'm looking at it framed on my wall right now uh, by Butch Geis because I wanted a basically a Blue Beetle pinup by Butch Geis, and and he just whoa man, it's just an awesome piece uh, of uh, Blue Beetle swinging beneath the scarab, uh, set against uh, smoke from a from a fire that's off off the page. Uh, and it's just a you know great iconic piece, and I, I will confess I wrote it because I I wanted to own that original, <laughs> the original I saw in my head, and of course Butch delivered um, something even cooler than I imagined, but yeah I've you know I've I've got a lot of artwork by uh, you know people I've worked with and, and you know who who you know who have become friends over the years and have generously gifted it to me. Now I don't expect these gifts. Back in the day, a lot of comic artists would demand pages from stories as if they had anything to do with the artwork, and they would get it. Uh, I could never do that. I, I don't, you know, except in the case, 
cases like with Butch where I, I let him know, yeah, I would really love to have this page. <laughs> so, and, 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 and when I particularly praise a page, Frank Fosco, we're working together on something big, uh, he knows when I go wild over one of the pages that I'm going to want that page, and he just sends it to me. So uh, thank you, Frank. Very generous man, Frank Fosco. I also have a sketchbook uh, that I've carried around for years, and uh, it's got some great stuff. Here's a terrific Dick Giordano, uh, Black Canary. Um, <laughs> Bill Sienkiewicz, Charles Clint Eastwood. Uh, Robert Atkins insists to this day, this is, he, and I've heard him tell this people even when he didn't know I was listening. He, he, to this day, Robert Atkins says, this, the, the best drawing I ever did of Snake Eyes is in Chuck Dixon's sketchbook. Uh, Rodolfo DiMaggio has to uh, blow everybody else away and uh, do something like this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's things like, you know, gorgeous Steve Epting Wash uh, portrait of Bane. So, um, you know, so I've got a lot of artwork from, from, you know, friends and collaborators and the rest of it. What's my favorite piece? I can't show it to you because I've never scanned it. Uh, but it's... It's a piece that never saw publication. I pitched an idea of a of a Batman Viking Elseworlds, Batman set in the Viking era, and and Kike Alcatena did a killer pitch piece of a Batman um, in a chainmail armor and an axe and a shield with a bat on it and all that stuff, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. Maybe maybe, maybe I'll get it scanned and, and, and show it to you, but yeah, I've got. You know, lots of pages and covers and all kinds of stuff that have been generously given to me over the years by uh, the amazing artists that I've been fortunate to work with. Now, what's the favorite thing of mine I've ever written? I, you know, it's not up to me to choose that, but people who have read Shrinkage, not to keep pushing Shrinkage, <laughs> which is available on Amazon, um, in, in Kindle and uh, paperback, um, I, it, you know, people that have read it have told me it's the best thing I've ever written. So I got to say, okay, I'll make this one my favorite. Now, Giant Robot or Robot Giants, oh, come on. <laughs> Confess, you just had to think of a fifth question. All right, what's your reading? What's your reading? People seem to like this segment. Uh, and, you know, I'm reading this stuff anyway, so why not tell you about it? Recently, I've been rereading Charlie's War from beginning to end. Charlie's War ran as a weekly series in Battle, the British um, Comics Weekly, written by Pat Mills, uh, artwork by Joe Cahoon. Uh, and it is, um, it's, it's the best comic about World War I ever done. I can't think of many other comics about World War I. But um, Mills goes into... Um, deep research. I mean, I learned stuff from this. I've read a lot about World War I, but I, I learned stuff from this comic that I had never heard of uh, before. And uh, it, it follows Charlie as a, a grunt in the trenches from 1914 to 1918. It also follows some of his relatives. Uh, he has a brother in the um, RAF, and I think it's a cousin in the Navy, so you get to see the, the, the whole war, and um, it's presented, you know, very frankly, often extremely brutally. Uh, this isn't the usual fare that was found in battle at the time or any of the British war comics, which were kind of boys' own adventure, you know, um, you know, <laughs> the Ardennes is the devil of a place, old man, kind of stories. Um, this, this gets into like, you know, cowardly officers, psychotic officers, uh, betrayal within the ranks, um, soldiers that don't get along, you know, they're not all on the same page about <laughs> fighting the Germans. And, um, it's, it, it gives you a lot to think about. It's very much an anti-war comic, but as they say, often any good war story is an anti-war story because who loves war? Um, so, yeah, I, I highly recommend Charlie's War. It's available in, um, you know, various reprint editions. I, I'm reading, there's, there's a 10-volume hardcover edition 
and I'm working my way through it. I, I've read it all before, but I wanted to read them chronologically, you know, within a finite space of time. So I'm reading them as if it's like a gigantic novel. And it, the experience is rewarding. Now, on the flip side of the Great War, <laughs> I was reading this collection from Dark Horse of Tubby, uh, Little Lulu's Pal. <laughs> I don't know how much of a pal Tubby was to Little Lulu. Uh, it's a collection of John Stanley um, Tubby comics from the 50s. And uh, Tubby is a character that fascinates me. He's one of my favorite comic book characters because he's so nuanced. There's so much. I mean, he's he's not Dennis the Menace. He's He's got an ego as big as all outdoors. Uh, he's really full of himself. Uh, he feels like he's welcome anywhere. Um, you know, one of the funniest stories in the collection is he simply invites himself to dinner at a neighbor's and then complains about the food all the way through. And when they throw him out of the house, he says, you know, I, I don't think uh, I'm going to accept an invitation from them anymore. <laughs> they, they, they hadn't invited him in the first place. Um, you know, the typical of John Stanley stories, it starts with the simplest concept imaginable, and by the end of the story, it's, it's complete madness, with Tubby in the middle of the chaos, um, not really aware um, of the uh, mayhem that he's creating all around him. Um, Tubby was popular enough to, to have his own regular comic and uh, collections, and I'm right here, a giant and, and well-deserved uh, because people love this character uh, as much as they love little Lulu. And Stanley, um, yeah, he, he, John Stanley always brought it uh, to the stories. He never patronized children. The vocabulary in the stories is high. Um, and there's a lot of different levels to read the stories on. Uh, but, but the greatest thing to me is just Tubby's, you know, hubris <laughs> is appalling <laughs> and that's where most of the humor comes from okay let's talk about hunter ninja bear this kickstarter campaign continues this epic 360 page graphic novel is complete it's not like other crowdfunder campaigns where you know give us the money so that we can do it we've already done it but we want to bring it to you in a special edition. It's, like I said, 360-page graphic novel for 30 bucks. That's a, that's a deal, my friend. Uh, what's it about? It's about a um, group of ninjas who are living in hiding because they outlawed ninjury. <laughs> Is there, did I just create a word? They, they outlaw ninja everything. And ninjas have to go into hiding. And so a bunch of ninjas are living in the forests beneath Mount Fuji. And they're farming. And they're plagued by a bunch of murderous, homicidal, man-killing bears. And ninjas are really good at what they do, but they're not really good at killing gigantic, grizzly-sized ursines. So they send one of their representatives to the United States. This takes place in the early 1800s. And he recruits a team of mountain men, American mountain men, to come back to Japan and hunt these bears to extinction. And things get complicated from there. It's just, it's just a huge period epic uh, filled with action and period detail and a huge cast, a huge ensemble cast of, of fascinating characters. Um, and... Uh, I, I know you'll enjoy it, so go check it out. I'll put the link in the comments below. Did you go over to Kickstarter and uh, show your support and get an incredible, big, fat graphic novel uh, in exchange? Hey, I want to thank everybody for listening. Thank you for watching. Thanks for, uh, if, you, if you did a super thanks, thank you, thank you, thank you. Or you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. And... Uh, liking, subscribing, all the rest of it. And I will see every single one of you, I hope, down the road.